It's all still waiting here, like a museum exhibit, the diesel locomotive that hauled the rockets. Radiation counts here were so high that Geiger counters kicked wildly off the scale. All safety features survive, like the six-foot-thick radiation-proof windows and the robotic arms that handle the rockets. And Gunn believes a few upgrades would make it safer and more acceptable to the public. The problem with this rocket stand was when it was previously used, it exhausted its exhaust gases completely out into the atmosphere. However, with modern engineering approaches, we can have a complete containment system engineered to receive all of these gases. The longest open-air test performed here took a nuclear engine to full power for just over an hour. Too brief, it seems, when you consider the six-month journey time to Mars, but the numbers are misleading. The crew of a Mars transfer vehicle could need as little as one hour full throttle burn time to get there and back. Because space is a vacuum, no atmosphere means no friction to slow things down. Once it's built up ahead of speed, the spacecraft can literally coast to Mars. On the final approach, the spacecraft turns and the engines are fired to put the brakes on. Gunn says full throttle testing was done once and it can be done again. This test stand could return to operation for future NASA development of nuclear rocket engines. So the future is very golden. One day, the Nevada desert may hear again the roar of nuclear rockets that pushes on. And there's now a detailed plan to harness nuclear power to get to Mars. NASA rocket scientist Stan Borowski carries the torch passed by Stan Gunn. Borowski believes the advantages of nuclear propulsion are just too good to ignore. The benefits of nuclear are its higher gas mileage, which is twice that of the best chemical rockets. That means we, we need less propellant and fewer numbers of heavy lift launch vehicles. Propellant is weight. And the less of that you have to haul into space, the fewer Earth launches you'll need. So for a typical mission to Mars with nuclear propulsion, we need about seven 80-ton launch vehicles. With, with chemical, we need at least 11 missions. That fuel efficiency will be critical to saving the crew if something goes wrong. Beyond the point of no return, they can't simply make a U-turn and head back. Earth is too far and moving away too fast. The only option, continue to Mars, circle the planet, and head back to Earth. With efficient nuclear thermal engines, they'll have more chance to get back home safely. During those long months aboard the spacecraft, the crew of a Borowski nuclear-powered vehicle will enjoy one comfort no manned mission has ever had before, artificial gravity. The crew will not be floating about on the way to Mars and back. Our vehicles are long and linear and can be rotated like the propeller on an airplane to be able to generate artificial gravity for the crew. And this will prevent the debilitating effects on the body of prolonged exposure to zero gravity. Wherever Borowski pitches the bold idea of harnessing nuclear propulsion for Mars, he faces some fearful people. Will his nuclear rocket become a nuclear bomb if somehow it blows up in Earth's atmosphere? possibility of that happening is very remote. During launch to orbit, the nuclear engine is just cargo. It becomes radioactive only when fully assembled and firing. Out in deep space, any malfunction triggers an immediate shutdown. Do we absolutely need nuclear propulsion to take people to Mars? Maybe not. But if we want to go for good, for a sustainable exploration story, the engineering solution that gives us nuclear propulsion Fission-based, nuclear electric, or nuclear thermal will be a more efficient solution in the long run to opening up the solar system for people. The propulsion choice is linked to another crucial decision, the trajectory or route to Mars. Not only is it at least 56 million kilometers away, it's a moving target. Plotting the right trajectory is life or death mathematics. and scientists are making thousands of important decisions about the spacecraft that will take us to Mars. But the planets dictate when the journey begins. 
Earth and Mars are millions of kilometers apart, moving around the sun at different speeds. Because their positions are always changing, the ideal moment to launch a manned mission to Mars only comes about once every 26 months. It's unimaginably precise. It's, it's probably the best analogy. It would be like threading a needle in the West Coast from the East Coast. There are two ways of going to Mars. The choice depends on how long you want to stay on the planet. The long stay mission gives you about a year and a half on Mars. On the outbound leg, the crew leaves Earth orbit when the two planets are relatively close. It's the same coming home, but the timing has to be perfect. Miss the window, and there won't be enough fuel to make it. If the astronauts on Mars don't hit the launch into that window at just the right time, then they can't get back to Earth. They have to wait for the celestial mechanics to, quote, come back into alignment. You're talking about Earth and Mars being in the right places at the right time to allow the vehicle coming back safely to Earth. The other option is a short stay on Mars, 30 to 60 days on and around the planet. And the route home is different. The flight path will take the ship past Venus using its gravity like a slingshot to pick up speed for the trip home to Earth. But as before, timing is everything. A few hundred meters from where the North Sea meets the Netherlands, the European Space Agency has been working on the critical decision concerning the two options for going to Mars. They've decided they'll learn more on the Martian surface in 500 days than a short stay. We have a launch window for that every 25 months. To go to Mars takes six to nine months. Then we'll be spending about 18 months on and around Mars, and it's going to take nine months to come back, and that gives us all in all a thousand day mission, which is a very typical value for a Mars mission. Italian aerospace engineer Laradana Bassoni oversees the team designing the spacecraft that can stand up to a thousand day return mission to Mars. All right, so we're gonna talk about the transfer habitation module, which is where our six astronauts are gonna spend months and months of their time during the journey to Mars and back. The Europeans are thinking big. The total length of the Mars spacecraft they envision is 100 meters, the size of a football field. Attached at the front of the transfer vehicle is the excursion module. It's a combination lander, temporary shelter, and ascent vehicle. The back half of the spacecraft is the multi-stage propulsion system that will carry the crew to and from Mars orbit. For the many months of the journey, this module will be the whole world to the six crew members. It will be a tight squeeze. The total living space for six adults is 300 cubic meters, about the size of an average apartment. The rest of the space is packed with food, water, and equipment. It's not just the nuts and bolts that's associated with the engineer. It's the humans interacting with that environment. You're talking about people who have to be a part of this colossal undertaking, and they've got to be comfortable with it. The Sony and her team are still learning the basics of manned space exploration. They've never launched their own manned mission, and they've yet to decide on a propulsion system. But no one wants to be left behind in the race for Mars. ESA wanted to know how we could actually start planning European technology development. 